Good evening, everybody. I'm curious who has already figured out what you learn about sex from a chocolate bunny. Um, uh, so I, I don't know if anybody has been stressed on that all day long. What's he going to... I cannot imagine that, that that has been the forefront in your mind, but we're going to satisfy your curiosity here in just a few minutes. Um, tonight, uh, a fun theology of sex. Mm, there we go, right there. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard a sermon specifically about sex, so let me get a show of hands. How many of you at some point in your history have heard a sermon dedicated to the topic of sex? Wow, just a, literally uh, just a couple of hands. Uh, okay, then we are in good company. Uh, my experience is rarely, uh, in, and it, it doesn't matter what type of church, it rarely uh, do people who attend church ever hear a sermon specifically about theology of sex? So by the time we're done tonight, at least everybody can raise your hand and say, yes, we have heard a lesson dedicated exclusively uh, to sexuality. Uh, our goal is to have fun and learn important information about a very sensitive topic. And so you've, if you've been here for any of the other sessions, you've noticed every once in a while we come up for air with an object lesson. Uh, and that, you know, there are a number of reasons why we do this. Number one, you may not remember much of any of my content, but you're going to remember that chocolate bunny. Um, a year from now, you're going to remember, oh, there's something about a chocolate bunny. Uh, just, just because those things stick in our, the visuals stick in our head. Uh, number two, when we're talking about something, uh, a sensitive area like sexuality, um, oftentimes it can bring up a lot of emotion, you know, whatever our background is. Uh, for some of us, the, the background can have a lot of shame and secrecy to it. For others, there can be a lot of hurt or a lot of guilt. Uh, and so having something that, hey, we can laugh at, it just, it's like coming up for air, hey, we have fun with that, and now we're going to go do a deep dive and talk about uh, the, the, the depth of content uh, in God's truth about this subject. So just kind of buckle your seatbelt. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun tonight, but I hope by the time we're done, uh, you're looking at this like, wow, I have never looked at an overall vision of what God designed sexuality really to be all about. I've heard a few rules or don'ts or, you know, uh, you better not kind of thing, but I've never stopped and looked at the picture and really understood the big picture. And that's the goal tonight is to paint the big picture. So to kick us off, you can learn a lot about sex from a chocolate bunny. Does anybody in here like chocolate? You know, hands got to be quick. Okay, right there, Red J. Would you come up and help me out for a minute? Uh, because the, the chocolate bunny can be yours. Matter of fact, the chocolate bunny is already yours. You don't? <laughs> yeah, I have never seen a facial expression change from to so quick. <laughs> so I'm going to give you the chocolate. The, the bunny, the, the chocolate bunny is yours. I don't need the bunny back. Okay? Uh, now, here, here's, here's my thing, though. But I love chocolate also. So I don't want to part with my chocolate. You keep the bunny, but leave me the chocolate. How? I don't either. <laughs> Does anybody have a way for her to keep the bunny, but leave me the chocolate? I'm thinking that's not going to happen either. So the whole thing is yours. I hope you enjoy it. Happy chocolate eating. <laughs> Give her a hand. Thank you. So, <clears throat> what do you learn about sex from that? Well, here's what you learn. Just like you cannot separate the chocolate from the bunny, because the bunny is chocolate. I mean, it, its essence is the chocolate. You cannot separate your sexuality from who you are. We are sexual beings. God wired us. Just from the day we are born until the day we die, our sexuality is just a part of who we are. And... No matter how much we might want to deny, I don't, I don't have thoughts like that. Yeah, right. Uh, if, if blood is pumping through your heart, you have thoughts like that. And you have feelings and you have attractions. It's, it's just a part of who we are. Uh, and that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And having one of those, where did I set it down? There we go. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, going all the way back to the beginning. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Now there's some unpacking to do in this verse. Uh, number one, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth. 
Uh, by the way, uh, first command, what, in, in all of Scripture, what was the first command God gave people? Yeah, right there it is. The first command was not, don't eat the fruit. That comes later. The first command was, loosely paraphrased, have a lot of sex. Because there's only one way to f increase in number and fill the earth. That is, for a lot of sex to take place. Um, because having sex once or twice is not going to fill an earth. It, it'll just add a couple of people to it. Um, again, there is a cultural myth. God is somehow anti-sex. Like, God look at, looks at sex as a bad or a dirty thing. That could not be further from the truth. Now, broken world sexuality, okay, the enemy's effect on sex has led to a lot of sexual brokenness and a lot of sinful enmeshment in sexuality. But God, that was not God's vision, nor is that God's plan. God designed sex to be very good. Now, I mentioned this morning uh, the one column. When God made the world, there was only one column. That's the good column. All through chapter 1, God makes something. He stands back, he looks and says, Behold, it is good. Everything is good. He even creates Adam. Everything's good. But then he creates Eve. And he introduces Adam and Eve, and he says, Have a lot of sex. And now that he gives that command, he looks back and says, Now behold, it is very good. God's vision for sex is it's very good. It is not the nasty. It is not dirty. It is not sinful. It's good. Not just good. Very good. So don't miss big picture. Sex is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But it does matter to God what we do with our sexuality. Ephesians chapter 5. But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality. Okay, definition of terms. Sexual immorality. Well, sexual involving sex, immorality, behavior that's wrong, um, behavior that goes against the nature of God, that doesn't live up to the righteousness of God. It's, it's incorrect or wrong behavior. So sexual immorality is the misuse of sexuality or sexual behavior that's not appropriate. doesn't matter what type of sexual behavior specifically. Again, last night, all the chocolate, the chocolate shop, chocolate graham crackers, chocolate... Um, Oreo cookies, chocolate uh, Cheerios, uh, chocolate peanut. It's, it's all chocolate. Doesn't matter what sexual behavior we're talking about. It's all, it's all sex. Or of any kind of impurity you have agreed because these are improper for God's holy people. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's God's will that you should be sanctified. That you should avoid sexual immorality. There's that term again. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So there's this cultural myth that it's just old-fashioned to have values around uh, sex that, that limit its use to, uh, to a marriage relationship. That, that's just old-fashioned thinking. That's like outdated thinking. Uh, well, not according to this passage. According to the truth that God reveals in, in this section of Scripture, it's not a human being's old-fashioned thinking. It's God's instruction. So again, we can reject it. I mean, God, God grants us the, the freedom in the world we live in to have choice and to choose or not choose to obey Him. But don't make the mistake of thinking, well, if I just dismiss traditional values or biblical values about sex, that, that's just people's old way of thinking. No, to dismiss that is to dismiss God's instruction. Um, God calls us to live a holy life, the, every part of our life, not just our sexuality, but sexuality is a part of that. And so I can't separate, just like the, the chocolate bunny, it's, it's chocolate, I can't separate the sexual part of my life from other parts of my life. We'll look more about that uh, here in a few minutes when we, th we talk about a passage in 1 Corinthians. Desires of the heart. I shared this uh, in one of the presentations last night, but uh, in talking specifically about the idea of modesty or uh, having good boundaries around how we conduct ourselves, whether how we present ourselves 
or how we behave, uh, why would that be a struggle for somebody? Why would someone who loves God and as a general rule lives their life uh, in a way that follows Jesus, why would somebody not exercise modesty when it comes to the sexual part of our life? Uh, well, to me, it goes back to this right here. Uh, in my choice for immodest uh, appearance or immodest behavior, either one, what's driving that? And it can be really helpful to just stop and pause button. I use that phrase a lot in the counseling room, pause. What's my motivation here? If I pick out a particular outfit, and I don't mean just an outfit that, that is attractive, but if I pick out an outfit that is intentionally sexually provocative, I'm dressing this way to get sexual attention or to be noticed in a sexual way, not to, uh, to celebrate the fact that uh, God made us sexual beings and, and there's a level of attractiveness that, that is just, that, that's a godly thing. Uh, I mean, God made us sexual beings, and there's no reason to hide from the fact that we, ex that, that we, um, we are physically attractive. Uh, th th there's no reason to hide from that fact, but I don't want to exploit that fact. I mean, th there's healthy, and then there are bookends on both sides that are unhealthy. So what might motivate me to intentionally try to draw sexual attention to myself in an inappropriate way? Well, okay, if I look at all these desires that God put in me, um, is there a desire that I'm misusing sexuality to try to, uh, to, try to fulfill? Even though it's only, it, it's only a facade, it doesn't really fulfill. Because when I walk into the room and heads turn, and I know those heads turn because I see the look, and that look tells me all that I wanted to see. It says they want me, they desire me. Oh, there's that word desired. Admired, desired, attention. If to me attention equals they want me or they approve, I'm looking for validation. I mean, there are a number of things that uh, the misuse of sexuality, actually the misuse of sexuality can hit every one of these things. Because in a healthy sexual moment between a husband and a wife, ideally every one of those gets fulfilled in a truly fulfilling way. So appropriate sex or sexuality hits all of those. But the misuse of sexuality can also make those feel in the moment, feel like they're being fulfilled. Again, they aren't, because when the moment's over, I'm, I'm back to deplete it. But in the moment, it feels like this right here. So sometimes I need to just take a look. Hey, what, what am I desiring in the way that I'm either acting, I'm flirting with these people, uh, or I'm dressing in a way that intentionally is going to call attention in a sexual way to my body. Um, so that can be a real helpful exercise to go through, and it requires gut-level honesty with yourself, which can be very difficult. Because I want to dismiss, I want to deny, I want to justify things or minimize. Um, hey, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with, I mean, God gave me this body, there's nothing wrong uh, with, um, with me celebrating the body God gave me. I, I don't disagree with that at all. There's a difference in enjoying and celebrating in a healthy way and exploiting and using my body to manipulate a weakness in other people. Those are two different things. So what might cause a person to, uh, or what might lead a person to sexual immorality? Uh, well, typically it's the misuse or an, a, a, um, 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 an attempt to meet a desire, but not in a healthy way. So... Again, sex is good, so it's, it's very good, but also God calls us to use sex in the right way. So God says, sex, do it, but do it right. Uh, you can learn a lot about sex from a pool stick. Now, I have been on four continents um, with this illustration, and it doesn't matter if it's teenagers or adults. doesn't matter if it's Australia, Uganda, um, the United States. doesn't matter. This gets more giggles than any other object lesson that we do. Some of you are a step ahead of me already because I see the smiles on your faces. Um, but you can learn a lot about sex from a pool stick. Stay with me for a minute. Okay, I have a, uh, it's almost a pool stick. It's designed to be a pool stick, but it's in two different parts right now. 
Now, some of you are familiar with plumbing or electrical equipment, and you know exactly what the names of these ends are. Now, more of you are catching on right now because I just saw more smiles break out on some faces. Okay, this end is referred to as the male end, and this end is referred to as the female. That's not just you know, coming out of nowhere. That's because they resemble male and female anatomy. Uh, if you're a male, you know you're a male because when you step out of a shower, if you look down or look in the mirror, either one, you, you've got something sticking out down there. It's called a penis. Uh, if you're a female, you know you're a female because you look down or look in the mirror after a shower and you don't have one of these. You have something that looks more like this. It's, it's an opening called a vagina. Um, here's how God designed humans. Male and female are designed to fit together. So the maker of this pool stick utilized a design com that, that God came up with in order to connect two different parts of the pool stick. Now, here's the really important part. Once the male and female ends have been connected, what do I have now? I've got a pool stick. I have a complete unit. That's the concept that God designed, is male and female are made different, and they're made to fit together. And it's not just about the act of joining them. Now, in our culture, not just our culture, for thousands and thousands, I mean, since time began, people have missed the big picture for just the, the behavior. And we, we get all excited and celebrate, literally, no, no pun intended, we get all excited and celebrate the act of coming together, and we forget that it's an act of coming together. It's unity, it's oneness or completeness. God designed male and female that when we come together, it's a oneness that takes place. Now, granted, he made it a very pleasurable act of coming together, but it's not just about that experience. It's about the, the bigger picture of unity or oneness that takes place. So don't miss the fact that male and female are designed to physically fit together or to be joined together. Again, there's nothing, um, nothing surprising about that. It's right here in Genesis. The Lord God said it's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he'd taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. Now this is where I wish scripture was a little bit more elaborate because I think there's probably some missing piece in here. Meaning I don't think that when Adam woke up and saw Eve for the first time that he instantly said this. I imagine there's, there's some missing piece out of the scripture. Like maybe... He woke up out of this deep sleep and he looks and for the first time ever there's another something like him. But it's different. And I'm thinking he comes out of this deep sleep and he sees this beautiful naked woman standing there and he probably says something different than this. Like maybe praise God or thank you Jesus. I don't know what. I, I don't know. I'm just saying we're human. And I imagine Adam had a human response to that, but he goes on, Scripture, and again, I'm, I'm making that up, I'm just conjecturing, but I think there was probably something going on there. Anyway, he said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she'll be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That's why man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife. Again, think pool stick. And they become one flesh. Uh, God made man. And it was just man and God. Now, they're in, they're in fellowship with each other. Again, there's no sin. It, it's all good at this point. So it's man and God. It's just Adam and God. Who says that just you and God is not enough? God did. God said, hey, me and you, just the two of us, that's not enough. I've heard a lot of famous preachers since the early 90s preach at people, you've got to be good with just you and God. And until you get good with just you and God, you're, you're not okay. I don't know that God agrees with that. I think God was the one who said, nope, that, that's not the right way. That just the two of us, man needs something more. And so God made another similar but different. Now God could have made another guy. God could have said, hey, you need a hunting buddy. Man, there's like a lot of animals out there, and there's a whole world to explore. You guys, let me make another man, and you guys just go have a big time. But he didn't. 
he said man needs something that, that's suitable for him to, to help and to complete. Not, not that I'm trying to you know, cite it like a Jerry Maguire line of you complete me, but that's, I know it's an old movie. Um, tell me somebody in here has seen Tom Cruise. That, okay, you, you do know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. Um, for those of you who are under the age of 30, um, that's an old movie. If you're my age, it's not that old of a movie. Um, anyway, so God makes a woman and then designs her in a way to fit with the man and male and female make one or create a sense of unity. And that's really se sex. The, the physical pleasure part of sex is the surface. The deeper part of that is the intimacy and the closeness and the oneness <coughs> that God designed it to facilitate. You can learn a lot about sex from a game of checkers. I need somebody who can think quick because it's a 30-second game of checkers. Who knows how to play checkers and can think fast? All right, very good. Legend, stay right there. Legend, stay right there. Good girl. Okay, I'll sit over here. I'll be the red pieces. You'll be the black pieces. The game will start with your first move. I need a timekeeper who's got 30 seconds on their wrist or an iPhone that can count down to 30 or something. Who will be my 30-second timekeeper? Okay, got a timekeeper back here. If you would start with his first move, and then I need a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 at the end. Oh, he's moved. Go. I heard real quick, I heard you say, you can't do that. And then he said something about cheater. And then, he, and then I heard, oh, so it's going to go that way. And then what did you guys see? He started, he started cheating too, exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, talk to me a minute. What, what were you thinking? I thought we were playing a game of sex. <laughs> uh, what ended up happening? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I did notice I kept cheating, and it didn't take but about four moves, and here you are joining in the fun, right? The, <laughs> the whole thing <laughs> fell apart. Thank you very much. Great job. Give him a hand. Good job. So, again, I've done this in a lot of places, and it's about 50-50. About half the people will keep playing by the rules, and the game falls apart. And the other half do that, and they, they join in the fun, and the whole thing just falls apart, and it's total chaos. Nobody wins. The game just disintegrates, and you can learn a lot about sex from that right there. There is a boundary or a rule, set of rules, that God created. Just like with a game of checkers, there are rules. There are things you're allowed to do and things you're not supposed to do. And as long as both people abide by the rules, it works really well. It can be a lot of fun. But if even one person breaks the rules, it changes the game for everybody. Hebrews chapter 13. Now, this is a short passage, but there's a lot of information we're going to unpack in here. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Okay, let's slow it down and take it bit by bit. First question, this passage is written to single people or married people? I hear a couple of yeses. I heard of both. Think a minute. Married or single? Final answer. Yes, it, yes, it is written to all. There, there's a key word in there that tells us that pretty fast. All. All. <laughs> Marriage should be honored by all. It doesn't matter if you're single or married, honor marriage. Uh, consider the marriage relationship special and, and worthy to be respected. Uh, it is a different relationship than anything else. There is no relationship like the marriage relationship that God designed. One man, one woman, together for life. That, that's what God's intention was. Now, we live in a broken world, and it doesn't go like that a lot of times. But that was God's design. 
And he says, respect or honor the marriage relationship. The, the marriage bed. Okay, this is a metaphor. He's not talking about a bed. There is not a marriage bed out there somewhere. What is it talking about? Right, say, the, the sexual relationship, the sexual part of that relationship. The marriage, the sexual part of your relationship should be kept pure. Question. Kept pure once you become married or kept pure before you get married? There's that all thing again. Right. Keep it pure. What I do at 12 will either keep my marriage pure or it will contaminate my marriage way before I ever get there. And what I do at 14 and 15 and 18 and 20 will either protect the purity of my marriage or it will contaminate it before I get to it. Because everything in my sexual history follows me into that marriage. Um, when we get to the Play-Doh, this hopefully will make a little bit more sense. But, but just understand that there is a boundary that God created around sex. And the boundary is marriage. He says, until you get married, sexual behavior should not be a part of your life. Once you get married, yes, it is good. It is very good. Do it. Do it a lot. Um, but that's, that's what you learn about sex from a game of checkers. Respect the boundary. Respect the boundary of marriage. Marriage, in marriage, yes. Outside of marriage, no. You can learn a lot about sex from a hole in the wall. I need somebody who is 18 or over, so you legally are able to make your own decisions, and somebody who can make a wise decision. So I need 18 or over, wise decision maker. Uh, you, you're getting volunteered. Are you willing to help me? <laughs> yes. Is that who you're pointing to? Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to say whose finger was pointing, but, but there was a finger pointing. All right, Legend, you just keep sleeping. If you would come join me on stage, we're going to step up right here to this bottle of water. So, bottle of water. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and take the lid off. And... You'll notice that that lid is sealed, so it's, it's like a legitimate bottle of water. There's, it hasn't been tampered with. And let me hand you a compliments of Chick-fil-A. They just don't know it. Straw to stick down in the water. And if you would take two or three swallows, I just need a little bit of air in the bottle there. So a couple, two, three swallows should be so that, That's sufficient. Okay. Now, here's the challenging part. If you would put the straw, leave the straw in the bottle, but put the top of the straw back in your mouth and sip enough to fill the straw with water, and then plug your tongue over the top of the straw so it keeps the vacuum, keep the straw in the water. There you go, that's perfect. So you've got the bottom of the straw is in the water, the top of the straw is in your mouth, and there is water all the way from the bottom to the top of the straw. Now, this is, don't move. Do not move. I have an extension cord, one end is cut, the wires are exposed, I'm gonna drop it right in the bottle of water. And on the other end down here, there's just a hole in the wall. I'm just going to stick it in the hole. Okay, just a hole in the wall. No big deal. Just a hole. And I'm just going to drop this end into that hole. Okay, so don't go anywhere. I'm getting just a second to get this in the hole. I hear a lot of laughter. What do you guys? What, what's what's so funny here? It's just it's just a hole. Okay, so here's the hole right here. I'm just going to put this in the hole. Oh, I, 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 <laughs> okay, hold on. Let's just talk. Because I said, don't move, but you're leaning over looking. It's just a hole in the wall. I wanted to see what I was getting into. Okay, so, so are you okay with sucking that water back up? Let me stick this in the hole. Oh! oh. <laughs> no, because... Because I could get shocked. Um, shock. It's just a hole. Yeah, it's just a hole, but this one was real locked. <laughs> Uh, I'm hearing some debate over me using the term it's just a hole. And I don't think me saying it's just a hole means the same thing to you. Right. It's not just it's just not a hole. No. What, what else is? It's got electricity. Ah, okay. <laughs> so let me have this back. And the rest of that is yours. Um, I, I said wise decision. I agree with you. Good, good decision maker. Thank you very much. Give him a hand. Good job. Okay. okay. It's not just a hole. 
there's a lot more connected than what you see. Um, more than meets, I'll, I'll deal with that later. Okay, more than meets the eye. Where are you getting this stuff? Well, I told you we were going to talk about 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 15. Um, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Okay, pause. Cultural relevancy. Let's, let's again, understand context. What is the writer trying to show us? Coming from the book of 1 Corinthians, which means it is written to Christians where? In Corinth. Okay, in Corinth, there is this huge temple to the goddess Aphrodite. Um, I couldn't tell you an exact number. Some commentators have estimated as many as a thousand prostitutes were employed at the temple of Aphrodite in Corinth. Now, Corinth is a port city, so a lot of shipping in and out of Corinth. Well, when you've got sailors who have just pulled into port and they have just been paid, what are they looking for? Right, a one-night stand. Typically, men who just got paid, again, this is a stereotype, but worldly, heathen, heathen culture, men have a lot of money in their pocket. They get off the ship. They've been out at sea for who knows how long, and they're looking for two things typically, alcohol, alcohol and sex. That, that's, again, that's... So in Corinth, there's a lot of opportunity for a prostitute to stay busy because you got a lot of guys coming off the ship with money in their pocket. So it's, it's kind of like Las Vegas in our modern American culture. Just by saying the word Las Vegas, things come to your mind because there's just a connotation to that. The readers who are, re who are reading this letter from Paul in Corinth, they read this and they see the word prostitute, they know what he's talking about. Everybody knew because it's just part of that culture. Now, there are new Christians in the church in Corinth who have come out of this pagan background. So there are Christians in the church who are reading this, um, who that's what they grew up doing, going to the temple and engaging in sexual acts with a prostitute. That was just part of their pagan worship ritual. Um, and, and it was fun because it was pleasurable. And so they did it. And there begins to be this argument or this, uh, this belief being expressed, this point of view in the church in Corinth that it's okay to do that because it's just a physical thing. My, my, my spirit belongs to Christ, but my body is not spiritual, it's physical. And Jesus doesn't care what I do with my body as long as my spirit is given or dedicated to him. So Paul is writing to address this, this argument that's going on in the church there. And that's why he's using this comparison to prostitute because culturally, that's what the thing going on was. Okay, I don't think, to the best of my knowledge, that there is a temple to Aphrodite in McPherson, Kansas. But cultural relevancy. You said, I said, I heard the term hookup. That is way culturally relevant because unless you've been hiding under a rock for the last 50 years, uh, the term hookup has an instant, you, you know what that means. We're not talking about a hitch on a pickup truck. Uh, we're, we're talking about a sexual one-night stand, friends with benefits, kind of emotionally unconnected sexual encounter. Okay, that our culture identifies with. So I'm going to read this passage, but instead of the word prostitute, I'm going to insert the word hookup partner. Because to readers today in a, a modern American culture, that's going to be the equivalent of what prostitute was to first century Corinth. Shall I then take the member of the body, the members of Christ himself? Shall I unite them uh, with a hookup partner? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a hookup partner is one with her in body? For it said the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. What is the overwhelming concept being stressed in this passage? Oneness, unity, unity, oneness, one with. It's about unity. It's not about a physical behavior. It's about oneness. So if I am a follower of Jesus, 
and I have given my life to Christ, I am one with him. How it, can a person who is one with Jesus, how can we possibly think it's okay to go and hook up with somebody that I have no right to in a sexual way because I'm not married to them? That's the concept that he's trying to help them understand. So he's saying, hey, here's what you guys are hearing. Here's what culturally is going on. But here's the truth God wants you to understand. Intimate connection. It's not just what you see. There is much more to sex than meets the eye. It's not just a hole in the wall. There's electricity. that connecting. When, when you connect to that hole, you are tapping into a, a whole grid of electrical power. And so what happens by tapping into that hole is, is going to be a shocking experience. I don't want to have a shocking experience right here. Um, if I connect sexually with somebody that I legitimately don't have a right to because they're not my spouse, something is going to happen with that that has a huge effect because I'm, I'm connecting with something that has a lot of power and energy behind it. Our sexuality is connected not only to our spirituality, but deeply connected to us emotionally and mentally and relationally, it is a behavior. It hits all five of the major areas of, of who God created us to be. Um, and so understand that God designed sex to be about intimate connection, emotionally connected experience, not just a friends with benefits hookup type sexual encounter. And then we'll end it out tonight with you can learn a lot about sex from a can of Play-Doh. Now, if anybody is kind of halfway nodding off or asleep or you know, deeply ingrained in Instagram photos or something like that, let me invite you to come back to the here and the now because if there's one thing you get from the entire weekend, maybe two. I think the Sprite is a pretty important concept. Um, if, now, if you weren't here last night and you're like, Sprite, what, <laughs> what's Sprite so important? Um, the, uh, look at the DVD talk to somebody who is here or something. Um, but the other major concept is this right here, and to, to a lot of people, it's just a, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and you just, I'm not sharing a concept that was like original with me. Now, the, the Plato illustration is an ultimate escape thing, but the, the concept is sexual arousal template. Uh, Dr. Patrick Carnes is the guru of sex addiction treatment, at least certainly within the United States. He is the guy who is credited with coming up with that term, sexual addiction. Uh, did a lot of groundbreaking research in the late 80s. Published a book in 1991 called Don't Call It Love. That was the first of what has become a lot of books, but uh, the first real in-depth research into adults who self-identified as struggling with what he coined the term to, to describe it as sexual addiction. Um, so the concept I'm going to share with you is a clinical concept called the sexual arousal template. But I'm going to put it in a Christian worldview, and we're going to talk through two different possibilities. Okay, one is God's original vision when he designed it, and the other is the broken world that all of us live in. Uh, so we're going to look at God's perfect plan, and then we're going to look at broken world uh, with effect of the enemy factored in. Okay, so my Play-Doh, it's going to take me just a second to get this pressed out into just a nice, pristine uh, little lump of Play-Doh with no indentations. So here we go. And the arousal template concept is basically all of us are designed uh, with the, in, the ability or potential to experience sexual arousal. Uh, I mean, literally, God wired the human body so that the moment we're born... We are wired to experience sexual arousal. Not that God planned that we would experience it on the first day on the planet, but that our body is capable of doing that. So God's plan is that we don't engage in any erotic sexual behavior, no erotic sexual encounters, until we get what? Here, we just talked about the boundary, checkers. Uh, respect the boundary. Boundary is marriage. So we're going to look at that perfect plan. Okay, now we flip this over. It's mostly, so it takes a little imagination, but pretend there is no indentation. It, this is a totally pristine lump of Play-Doh, sexual arousal template. This is your sexual arousal template. Okay, God's perfect plan. 
no experience, no, because you're living in a perfect world. So sex is not plastered everywhere. Everybody is respecting the boundary around sex. So I'm not in a sexually invasive culture. So uh, here I go up until marriage. I'm not engaging in any erotic sexual behavior. Now I get married. Okay, so I say I do, and you say you do, and the minister says you guys are. Now go and do. Uh, you understand what I'm saying there. Uh, and so we go and we do, and in that moment is our first sexual experience. We just got married, and there is our first sexual encounter, and in that arousal template, okay, this is my spouse, this is my arousal template, what do you see in the arousal template? There's a handprint. How detailed is that handprint? Lines, wrinkles, scars. The really important part is what's in here. What's in this area of the arousal template? Fingerprints. Fingerprints. How unique is this arousal template now? Very. How many hands on the planet perfectly fulfill that arousal template? One. This one. No other. Again, God's design. First sexual encounter in that arousal template. Now, what does the arousal template long for for perfect fulfillment? That same person. Perfect world. God's perfect plan. Come back together. How fulfilled is it? Perfectly fulfilled. We're apart. I long to be together. We're together. It's perfectly fulfilling. For how long? For life. That's what God designed sex to do. That's God's plan. The problem is we don't live in a perfect world. We live in a sexually invasive culture. You cannot escape sex. If you're four years old, you have seen all kinds of sexual stimuli. Um, so, again, pretend... I'm not going to take the time to redo all this, but just pretend this is, this is blank. I just flipped it over, pretend this is blank. This is broken world. This is enemy's effect on sex. Average age of exposure to erotic sexual content. Well, in 2006 or 7, focus on the family um, survey, average age exposure is age 5. My little 5. Now, this is... 15 years ago, what would you guess has happened to that age in the last 15 years? I would expect it to go lower, not higher. Five years old, little eyes see erotic sexual content. We see something that is intended to provoke sexual stimulation or sexual arousal. I'm five years old, I'm walking through the checkout line at any grocery store, and what do my five-year-old eyes see in the checkout line. Magazine covers that are designed to do what? Arouse sexual attention. It's not saying that they're hardcore porn, but the image on that, on that magazine is there for a reason. It's there to pique sexual interest and generate sexual arousal. My five-year-old eyes saw it. Now they may also, as one client I had, uh, five years old, well, not, not the client was five, but when he was, he was 14 when he started coming in, but at age five, his first sexual memory, five years old, walking through the living room, there's a James Bond movie on, and it's a sex scene. He remembers it plain as day. Five years old. That was his first, first arousal moment. Well, arousal template, once my eyes have seen that, something in my body wants to do what? I want to see it again, because that's what an arousal template does. Whatever my first exposure was, I want to do it again. Five years old, I don't understand it at all. I just know that I want to see that again because my body liked how it just felt. Fast forward a few years. Uh, sexual touch. I do not mean holding hands. I don't mean romantic touch. Sexual touch. Su touch that is intended to produce sexual arousal. It could be intended to produce sexual arousal in the person who is doing the touching it can be intended to produce sexual arousal in the person who is being touched. Sexual touch enters my world. 
Um, just in today's culture, mm, 14, 15, think freshman year of high school. Probably average age where sexual touch is introduced. Now, there are some who it's a lot younger, uh, and there are some who it may be older, but just average. And not much further down the road than that is somebody uses their mouth for an oral sexual encounter. Again, definition of terms. Somebody is using their mouth on somebody else's genital or private or sexualized area uh, to produce sexual excitement or sexual arousal. Um, wow, then that more than half of 17-year-olds in 2006 had engaged in a sex in a oral sexual encounter. Um, again, that's 19 years, no, 14 years ago. I'm going to assume in our culture that the age is going down, not going up. Fast forward, uh, I'm 18 years old. High school senior, college freshman, something. I go to a party. Now, while I'm at the party, I'm not looking for some kind of sexual encounter, but while I'm at the party, because I had a little too much, or I'm under the influence, whether my own choice or somebody put drugs in a drink or has drugged me, and their choice, but I'm going to let the little cup represent alcohol or drugs, so there's, there's something that I'm under the influence of, and because of that influence, either my choice or somebody else's, but there's a sexual encounter I wasn't looking for, but it happens. So that's in there now. Yes, I did intend to do that, because now there's a lot of broken in that arousal template. Um, tears are starting to come up in my eyes right now because I work with clients who've experienced this. Uh, working with one right now in her 40s, three occasions as a young adult, high, drunk, and raped at a party. Not her choice, but it happened. And she is 40 and just now starting to deal with it, and it has affected her marriage in a huge way. So I'm not making this stuff up. This is reality. Now we fast forward a year or two or whatever in five years and, and we get married. So I do, you do, go and do, and we do. And this time, how fulfilled is my arousal template in that first marriage sexual encounter? How fulfilled is it? Right. It's not fulfilled. Because there are other things in here. This doesn't match. I'm not saying it's not enjoyable or not fun. It's not fulfilling. And it leaves something still lacking that wants to be fulfilled. I've worked with a number of young married couples in the first year or less of marriage. One or both is already going outside of the marriage looking for something because what they thought was going to be a great life together because of their earlier stuff it's not working. It's not going to get fulfilled from this. Working with a, a, at a summer Bible camp, just volunteering at a Bible camp one summer, uh, July 4th, my phone my, went somewhere on the campus and my phone had coverage for a second and boom, 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 and voicemails pop in. So I listened to the voicemails. One is from a 23-year-old, um, been married. This was her one-month anniversary. July 4th was 30 days, one month. Got her cell phone bill. Now, this is back a lot of years. Cell phone bill, long distance wasn't just included. $900 bill. Husband has been having phone sex with women all over the country. They've been married one month. He comes in. We start working together. First few sessions, start to get history, background. Oh, he's been doing this for years. But he thought, once I get married, I won't want to do it anymore. We talked about last night, the myth. When I get married, it'll all stop. Nope, get married, it just affects more people. So within 30 days, he's had $900 worth of phone sex in his new marriage relationship. Because that's just one example. We'd be here for hours if I tried to share with you all the examples of how all this stuff has an effect. We live in a broken world. Most of us our experience sexually resembles this more than the other side. Not saying every single person, but probably the majority of us. And what we need is healing. We, we need God to fix this. Because trying to navigate a marriage 
when every time my hand comes in here, there's other stuff in there that it's just not fulfilling, that, that doesn't work well. It, it in, we end up looking for something more. And whether it's porn or an affair partner or whatever, trying to introduce stuff into our marriage that we saw in porn. We're working with a couple right now. That does not work well at all. You've got a couple that's been married a few months, and I don't know they're going to make it. Nor do I know that they should make it. Because what the husband has done, I, I, I don't know. How do you get past? I don't know. Um, that, that's a God healing thing. I will say if, if they survive this, it will be an act of God. Um, thankfully, we serve a God who has the ability to do that. God can change our heart. God can transform our mind. God can take all the mess that we have exposed ourselves to, and God can bring healing to that. And again, you would leave before we got to the end of the stories of the success stories that just in tears are going to come up right now. Just because you have been hurt in the past or made poor choices in the past does not rob you of a satisfying sexual relationship for the rest of your life in your marriage. But I will not underscore how hard that journey can be to get there sometimes. Um, I, I don't want to do injustice and gloss over that and say it's just an easy thing, nor do I want to ignore the power of God to do the impossible. But many of us in here tonight need God to do this. I had a, a, I'm going to go off script for a minute. Uh, if, I, if tears come up, bear with me. I try to be uh, authentic in what I encourage other people to do. I was working with a 14-year-old, I mentioned 14-year-old client earlier, five years old, James Bond movie, um, at age eight. Again, nobody said a word to him about sex ever as parents. No sexual information. At eight, he goes to a friend's house. They spend the night together on the same couch. Somehow or another, friend, somehow or another, Sexual touch. A lot of sexual touch goes on that night. He goes home the next morning. He's eight years old. He goes home, and what he has decided in his eight-year-old mind is God put him to a test, and he failed. He was really, really mad at himself, and he was ticked off at God and didn't say a word to anybody. By age 14, he is acting out sexually with other people in the neighborhood involving one much younger boy to which his mom opens up the door and sees it going on. Well, now legal issues. So that means they're looking for a counselor. They end up finding ultimate escape. We worked together for almost two years. Uh, train wreck does not begin to describe the effect of from 8 to 14 all that being in secret did in his mind. Uh, there was a lot to undo. We worked together for a long time. He did some really difficult work that most adult clients would have given up and gone home. And he stuck with it. One of our last sessions, um, he, had, he had come such a long way. He, w he was off all medication. His, uh, his mom says it is a totally different son. Uh, he has come a long way. But he is still struggling with guilt. Um, and so we do this exercise in my office where uh, you know, it's an experiential thing designed to help him figure out what's at the core of the why, why is he still feeling so much guilt. And uh, we come up, he, he finally gets to, I, I am so bad I don't deserve God to forgive me. That's it. That's the message inside. I'm so bad I don't deserve God's forgiveness. So now we got, we know, what, we know what we need to unpack now. So I set up this exercise designed to do that. Uh, he picks out a lamp in the room to represent God. And I said, now I need you to pick out an object to represent the enemy. He points to a heater on the floor, and that's the enemy. That's, I, I got a kick out of that. Um, the, the heater is, represents the devil. Um, think about that just a second. It makes sense. Um, so uh, Play-Doh. Had the Play-Doh in his we, we'd done the, all the little impressions, so he had all these, the behaviors that had been involved in his life, all these different, in, they're in there. Um, so he's, he's decided he wants to ask God to forgive him. So he's got this Play-Doh with all the in, in his hand, and he's going to walk over to the lamp and ask God to forgive him. But instead of walking to the lamp, he takes a few steps back. That's when we realize it's the I'm so bad, God doesn't. So I just did a simple 
two voices in the universe. At the end of the day, there are two voices in the universe. There's the enemy, and there's the voice of truth. You got the devil, and you got God. Which voice would be saying to you, you are so bad, you don't deserve to be forgiven? I get, it took about a minute. I just sat there watching him process. His eyes land on the heater on the floor. He says, the enemy. I said, what might the voice of God be saying? And I don't, even, I don't remember a response. I got distracted. I was watching his hands. Hands are doing this right here. And I said, tell me what you're doing with your hands. He looks down and a smile like I have never seen broke out on his face. Never seen on him. Never seen him smile like that. He says, I can ask him now. We just need God to undo what the enemy has done in our life. And it's possible. But it's not always easy. Okay, that's a lot of psycho babble in there. Where I thought this was a theology of sex, not a psychology class. If you know what you're looking for, it's as plain as day. May your fountain be blessed. Okay, this is a metaphor. He's not talking about a fountain. He's talking about sex. May your fountain be blessed. May you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breath satisfy you. What's the next word? May you ever, as in forever, be captivated by her love. If that does not scream sexual arousal template, I don't know what it is. God designed sex to be a one man, one woman covenant relationship fulfilling for a lifetime it's a beautiful plan but the enemy finds ways to to rob and destroy that starting at an early age we don't even know what in the world we're doing because our culture screams such a different message it's all about the pleasure and it's whatever makes you happy and there's nothing wrong with any of it you just do whatever you want to do that makes you happy and that is so opposite the picture God paints. Because the do whatever you do to make you happy leads to a lifetime of constantly trying to reach something to provide fulfillment. And the picture on the internet that you just found is like the ultimate picture, but tomorrow you won't even be interested in it. Because now it requires something different and something more. I have a friend in recovery who said, Steve, the best way I know to describe sexual addiction is when you can never get enough of what you hate. Man, I, I let that sink in for a minute. thought, that's great. That is short. It is accurate. And it is a powerful way to describe it. An endless lifetime. Never enough. God's way is way different than that. At the end of the day, God's vision for sex provides for a lifetime of true fulfillment, not an endless chasing of the dragon, so to speak. Ultimately, sex is not really about sex. It's a representation. It's a way literally to touch and feel the kind of intimacy that God longs to have with us. Sex, when it's done right, is an example of that relationship God wants to have, where we are fully known, and we know God as fully as we can, and nothing is hidden. I don't have to hide parts of myself from God, or try to hard, hide parts of myself from God, or anybody else, because I am totally, uh, totally and completely known and accepted, and it's, and it's a two-way street. That's what sex is designed to be. It's not just about the pleasure. Now, it's pleasurable. That's a whole other presentation. Sex in the brain, it is definitely pleasurable. But that's not the end of it. That's just, that's just the beginning of it. It is emotionally fulfilling. And, and those desires of the heart, it's where we have the best opportunity 
to have real fulfillment of all of those desires because it mirrors relationship with God. Um, that is a fun theology of sex part one. There's a whole other part two. More scripture, more what's the picture look like, but that's, that's the introductory. Uh, and I hope at this point you have a bigger picture of what sex is really about. It's not a behavior. It's not a pursuit of pleasure. Uh, it is pleasurable, but it's not this endless pursuit of more and more and more pleasure. Uh, it's an intimate, emotionally connected, safe relationship in which I can enjoy being known and know the other person. And man, it is, it is deep because you never, ever get to a point where I fully know everything about this person. You can be married 50, 60 years, and you're still, there's more in there to learn and get to know because we always grow and change, and what a, what a thing. Um, God wants you to experience that depth and richness in this whole thing we refer to as sexuality. Uh, it is so much more than what our world has to offer us. Um, I hope Ultimate Escape can be a, a resource for you, and, and whether you're a parent, an you know, an, uh, as an individual, whether you're a teenager, whether you're an adult, I hope we can be a resource for you. Let me share a couple of things as we wrap up and get ready to head home. Um, number one, we have a podcast. It's just called Ultimate Escape. It's available at all the major podcast outlets, iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher. It's even on Spotify. You can say, Alexa, play the latest Ultimate Escape podcast, and it'll pop right up, or at least it's supposed to. Um, and, and it covers different topics. The first four episodes are introductory. It's my story, my wife Holly's story, and then episode three is our couple's journey because we had eight years of horrible marriage, and then we got some help, and we've had 20 years of a really good relationship. Uh, and so the, the episode three is that story, and then episode four is the birth of Ultimate Escape and where this ministry came from. And then from that point, episode five following, it's topical. Uh, some of them are lighthearted. There's one on how we've used Rottweilers in ministry to help people connect with God. Uh, Baby Ruth, Legend, it, it's just, it's a fun podcast. If you like dogs, I encourage you to find that I, I don't, episode seven, I think it is. Uh, but it, it's, it, it's, it's findable and, and pretty obvious. Uh, other episodes are, you know, there's one episode, I think it's episode nine. What about masturbation? Um, that is the most common question, regardless of country we're in, the most common question we hear, teens, adults, everybody. Uh, and so we just dedicated a whole podcast episode just to the discussion of that one particular topic. Uh, I think at the moment it is the most listened to of all the podcast episodes, if that gives you any insight. Um, but there, you know, what do I do if my child has been sexually abused? What if I'm an adult, uh, and this one was more targeted to females, what if I'm an adult and was sexually abused at some point and have never dealt with it? What, what do I do? Or what if I have a friend who's in that position? What can I do? Uh, so there's a number of different topics. Um, th they're designed for, uh, for adults, for teens, for church leaders, for people who work with young people. Again, just different topics. But, but know the podcast is there, and I hope it's a helpful resource for you. Um, the website. Uh, it, we are in about to embark on a total redesign of our website to simplify it a lot, but for the moment, if you have any interest in the ministry, go to the parent portal. There's a teens, parents, and a professional. Uh, just go to the parent section. Uh, there are a number of videos available, different presentations, um, and, and information about different topics like sexual identity, sexual addiction, um, et cetera. Um, if you know a church or if you have connections with a church where you think this kind of information will be helpful for them, please help me connect. Make a phone call, send an email, uh, tell me who to talk to. But if you'll make the introduction, that'll make it go a whole lot smoother uh, than if I just call and they don't even know me from, from whoever. Uh, I really appreciate your comment last night uh, that every church should have this, in, or you said me, that, but at this information. Um, and if you can help connect me with other churches, we greatly value that. Um, if you know of somebody who needs a phone consult, uh, hey, this is going on in their family, they need some direction, some resources, share my number. Uh, it's, on, it's on the website. That's what we do. Uh, that, that, and I get phone calls from people literally all over the globe 
this is what's going on. Give us some direction. You know, how, how do we deal with that? And whether it's an eldership, a minister, a parent, an individual, uh, that's what our ministry exists to do. Uh, and we are very thankful for the long-term partnership that we have uh, here with you guys and, and look forward to hopefully that continuing in the future. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here this week. I hope it's helpful, and we look forward to the next time. Hey, Legend, uh, she's out like a, like a rock, okay? Anyway, Legend says thank you for all the pets on the head. Thank you. <laughs> hey, girl, yes, you hear your name. We were thought, yes, say thank you, everybody. Up oh, there I go again. All right, <laughs> I'll turn it back over. If you're interested in the resources, I'll, I'll be out there at the end and take care of that too. Report of the building. Oh, building. sorry, grounds building. All right, didn't mean to put you on the spot. Thank you. Well, that's really hard to follow. <laughs> I do have a, I do have just a few things. Won't take very long at all. Um, this is what went on around here yesterday. Um, everybody knows before men can do much work, they have to eat. So we had an excellent breakfast. Thank you, Jason, and your helpers. And then we installed, oh, uh, somewhere around 25, I don't know if anybody got a count, 27 larger book holders. Thank you. We had a great turnout of somewhere between 15 and 20 uh, men. So it was an excellent fellowship, excellent. The work just didn't take hardly any time at all. A um, couple other things. S notice something really good in the nursery this week after that big rain that started last Sunday. There was no damage on the ceiling tile for the first time in a long, long time. So praise the Lord. I hope we finally got it fixed at least for a while. Um, the other thing I'll just mention right quick is um, we've been working on new lighting in the auditorium. Uh, the first experiment didn't work really well, and I sincerely apologize to anybody that was uncomfortable with that. Um, certainly didn't intend it that way. We're going to continue to work on it until we get it right. Um, got a lot more to do. Um, I don't know of any other projects that need attention right now. I appreciate all the help from everyone that does things without being asked and and when asked responds very well. So uh, I guess that's all I have. Is there any questions or comments? And feel free to contact me anytime or talk to me about any wants or needs.